everybody, and welcome to the Tech Educator Podcast. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us today and making the TeacherCast Educational Broadcasting Network your home for professional development. Tonight, we're going to be talking all about robotics. We have two amazing companies represented from Sphero and also from Microbrick talking today about how you can bring robots and robotics into your schools and into your classes. But before then, I want to introduce Sam Patterson. Sam, how are you today? What's going on in your neighborhood? Uh, I'm doing incredibly well today, and we are all about toy hacking this week in the neighborhood. I'm getting ready to host a small group of teachers for a play date on Friday to take apart some toys and connect them to different boards like the uh, micro bit and make them do some cool stuff. That is pretty cool. I've seen you've been doing a lot of stuff with uh, robots recently here. Um, we are happy to start off the show today by introducing something that's pretty cool and new to the TeacherCast universe. Sam, tell us a little bit about what we've been working on the last couple of days. Well, for years, we've been trying to figure out what are good tools to use in teaching and you and I realize that we've done a number of these and we should really kind of formalize them a bit so we've come up with the teacher cast certification process that is right Sam a 15 point checklist that's basically showing off why products are good talking about what they can do in class what they can't do in class um, we're even taking these uh, products websites stem robots you name it and uh, comparing them against all the ISTE standards why is it important that we take a look at these not only as what they can do, but against some of these national technology standards? Well, we're all trying to figure out how to make the best decisions we can for the students we serve. And presenting these robots in a context that says, oh, working with this can help illustrate this standard, this standard, or this standard, helps not only the stakeholders closest to these decisions, understand them but people on school boards or you know people who are actually very far away from the classroom who might say i don't know why would you need a robot for english class and so we are proud to announce that uh, over the last couple of days we have announced our first two recipients of the teacher cast teacher cast best in class award and uh, the <laughs> I know. And the first one was uh, a fantastic screencasting application called ScreenFlow uh, from our friends over at Telestream. They just came out with version 7. We had a chance to check that out and uh, write up a great review showing why ScreenFlow is perfect for your classroom. And today, in fact, we released a podcasting uh, equipment uh, called the Padcaster. We had a chance to meet with them at ISTE this year and uh, take a look at them. And the Padcasters are pretty darn cool. So we did a quick review up on there we wanted to announce that those are the first two but that's not all sam we have uh, another amazing um announcement that we'd like to bring up of the next edition sam who maybe is on this show doesn't know it yet but is being uh nominated and and uh, delivered to us here as our teacher cast best in class robotics company uh well the uh, it's actually kind of a, a double header as the show is because we've got you know two of the recipients on the show with both microbrick and sphero creating really top end tools for teachers to use in the classroom and through our own experience as teachers working with these tools as well as the rigorous 15 point review process we've really identified these as leading tech that make a big difference in the classroom so let's get down to it and we'll introduce our next two recipients of our teacher cast best in class review. I want to bring on from Microbrick, Miss Kat Kennyworth. Kat, how are you today? I'm doing very well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure getting to know you over the last few weeks here in the summertime. For those of you who have not seen everything yet that's been going on in teacher cast land, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so uh, again, my name is Kat Kennewell. I am the product and marketing manager for Microbrick, which is an educational robotics company based out of South Australia. Uh, we are best known for our product, the Neat Edison robot, which is the little orange robot. Um, and yeah, that product launched with the Kickstarter in 2014. And just a couple of months ago, we released our third programming language for it, which is Edblocks which is a horizontal block-based programming application that's a drag-and-drop application 
using the Scratch 3.0 code. Um, and we also have a hybrid graphical and text-based programming language for Edison um, called Edware and a Python-based one called EdPy. And then Edison is also quite well known for the fact that it has inbuilt sensors. So it can sense obstacles, light, sound. Uh, it also has a line tracking sensor that allows it to track dark and light surfaces beneath it. Um, and they can use infrared to communicate with other Edisons. And they are also Lego compatible, which allows for a huge amount of different build and interesting technical projects to be done with them there. I got to tell you, I've been playing with these Edison robots for a while now. They are absolutely fantastic. Sam, I know you've been playing with them. What have you found about these Edison robots? Well, the Edison robots are nice because they don't take up much space. If I, as a teacher, want to run a, a uh, robotics activity on the tables that my kids sit at, I can, uh, which is kind of nice. Um, they're also, you know, quick enough to, to go tearing around the floor also. But the, um, the real difference with the Edison robots is they've got the build points for the Lego bricks, which allow you to kind of convert the axle movement into all kinds of different rotational energy. So if you're looking at you know, creating systems or mechanisms or automations or anything like that, the Edison robot can, you know, be literally the motor that drives that. Our next guest is from a great company called Sphero. You might have seen them as the makers of the very popular and awesome, I must say, BB-8 toys. Uh, S Jeremy McDonald, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm well. I'm well. Thanks, Jeff. Tell us a little bit about yourself and tell us a little bit about Sphero. So, um, again, my name is Jeremy McDonald. I'm the content and training manager for Sphere Education. And I just actually just recently started in March. So prior to this, I was a uh, director of technology for a school district in Redmond, Oregon, and then had about nine, 10 years of classroom and instructional coaching experience prior to that. Um, so I'm kind of new to this out of the classroom uh, experience. Um, still kind of getting the hang of things, but over here at Sphero, uh, we're having a lot of fun, and uh, we're looking forward to this new school year. But I, I guess a brief history of Sphero. Um, back in 2010, uh, our founders recognized that we weren't doing a whole lot with our phones other than making calls, uh, a few text messages here and there, and a couple apps, not a whole lot there. And so they decided they wanted to find out, a, figure out a way that we can connect uh, with the world around us, and they decided to start with, uh, with how we play and interact with our toys. And so they developed the Sphero and down the road, a bunch of teachers got their hands on it and became super interested in how they could use these in the classroom. And uh, actually many of them began to cut them in half and open them up and see what was inside. And so we said, uh, let us just make you a clear one so you don't have to break them anymore um, and save, save you some money. So we made the Spark Edition, which is now our new educational robot and uh, which is all programmable through the Sphero EDU app. Um, as well as Swift Playgrounds at this point. And uh, the Sphere EDU app um, has a drawing uh, block space and a text-based programming all with the, um, that runs on JavaScript at this point. And then we've got some future integrations that's uh, hopefully coming around uh, this next school year and uh, next spring and summer that we'll be excited to announce. That is pretty cool. Um, and I, I love the fact that the teachers are helping you guys to design these things. That is always wonderful when we can get education into the, uh, into the, uh, the innovation sphere here. But you Well, know and that was the, uh, the first way that I met Sphero was they were trying to, they had been turned on to the fact that some teachers thought they could use this programmable robot in class and they were actively seeking out uh, input from other teachers. And that's been a long time relationship. And basically I've known Sphero since I've been teaching tech and that has been a, a really rewarding kind of thing. And working with the kids and the Spheros taught me a lot about using robots in class with kids. And um, unless I miss my guests, that's what we're transitioning to now, Jeff. Am I right? Well, we have two more guests that we want to introduce oh. here because not only is this a robotic show, Sam. See, we can both make mistakes. But we are also concerned about what those robots can do in class. So we have a right? director. Uh, uh, help me out here, Jennifer. Director of technology. Techno what is the new title here, Jen? And by the way, one more time, congratulations. 
<laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Director of Instructional Technology. Director of Instruction. So you're the one that's going to be helping to make the decisions between bringing in Edison robots and bringing in Spheros. So they're going to be on their best behavior looking for your decision and your educational dollars. Jen, tell us a little bit about what's been going on in Teaching Forward. I saw that you came out with a brand new uh, or an updated cheat sheet. Uh, so, yeah, with new releases to Classroom, I summarized some of the key features that I think will be most attractive to teachers and updated my uh, cheat sheet for teachers as they move into the school year. I think they'll be really pleased to see some of those updates. Awesome. Also on our show, rounding out our panel, I want to bring on Phil. Phil, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, please introduce yourself. I am a, I'm a teacher in uh, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, in the uh, Upper Park Yeoman School District. I'm a technology and engineering teacher, and uh, I've been experimenting now with Edison for the past eight months, and I'm about to roll it out in three weeks to my students, and I have a lot of cool design challenges uh, to give them. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing how the, how the students interact uh, with this robot because, you know, for me, it's really about the programming and teaching the students the logical thought. And uh, Edison, right out of the box, you know, it's easy to program. And uh, I'm looking forward to this experience over the next couple of months. That is awesome. Thank you, first of all, everybody, for showing up tonight. And, of course, we are here live on the Tech Educator Podcast. This is episode 160, as we are here every single Tuesday night at 8 p.m. at East uh, at uh, TeacherCast.tv. Sam, you've got a pretty interesting conversation lined up tonight. What are we going to be talking about? And take it away. Well, I thought we would start by talking about one of the things that robots can do really well but I think sometimes takes a little bit of nuance and we've got some big brains in the room, so I think we can get there. But I have found that robots can be really useful for making abstract ideas more tangible for students. And I thought we could kind of go around and just kind of talk on that theme. Is there anybody that wants to start off? I would love to share some activities that our teachers have done. Um, I think, as you would said, Sam, like the, the thing that is so exciting about robotics is it, it gives, you know, the ability for students to have a concrete um, result of the things that they're talking about and learning about. And, and I think, you know, some, sometimes teachers look at something like a sphere and say, well, what's the big deal? It's a ball that rolls around. And then you start to talk to them about, well, let's talk, let's have a conversation about what are the objectives you have for your students learning and and let me help you to identify the ways in which this can dovetail really nicely into your curriculum. And so some of the most recent um, experiences that we've um, had our students uh, to uh, use Sphero just as, a, as an example in the last couple of months of school, um, at the high school level, we used it in a physics lab where students were learning about um, vectors and, and they programmed, you know, two different, um, you know, vectors for Sphero and then had to calculate the resulting vector to get the, to get Sphero to return to the origin point. And so they're doing that math out on paper and then programming that and then confirming that it's landing where it began. And so it just really, it was a great example of a simple way to take the, you know, the robot and, and help to have students practice this skill, which was very important, but, but get a real clear visual confirmation that their calculations were right. Um, in, a, in a middle school science class, um, a few weeks later, where they were studying forces in motion and speed, calculating um, the speed and looking at different speed graphs, we did a number of different experiments, which actually is going to be coming out on a post on my blog in the next few days. So this conversation is really well-timed. Um, that's actually a guest post from the science teacher, Adam Stahl in, um, in my former district who put together his, um, his lessons and shared some video clips of his students. But it was a great experience. I was there with him and the students as they were learning about um, how, to, how to calculate the speed that Spiro um, you know, traveled by setting up like, uh, you know, lines on the floor and getting the robot to roll and measuring the time it took from one place to the other. And then also did a great experiment around uh, graphs. You know, they're, they're learning about speed graphs and how do I 
if I show you a speed graph, what could, you know, could you write a program to show how Spira would mimic the action of that speed graph? So there's just a lot of opportunities. And those are just a couple examples that happened in the last few weeks of school. Excellent. Yeah. And th those things where um, I, I, I'm almost nostalgic about the first rate time distance lesson I did with Sphero because it was so many programming interfaces ago and, and whatnot. But um, the kids, you know, would actually measure what the robot was doing. And this is what I love about, you know, like the Edison robot and regular shapes, right? If you're in first grade, you learn about shapes and you learn about regular polygons. And if you're learning about regular polygons, it's a great time to learn about loops. So if you program a simple loop where you're going forward and turning a 90 degree angle and you do it four times, it makes a square. Now with my second graders, actually it was before, um, we have then taken that idea of four angles at 90 degrees equals 360 and then kind of worked backwards as far as how many, like if you want something with eight sides, how much does that need to turn, right? And it's just kind of a geometry playground, if you will. We, we had a maths teacher do that with the Edison robot and the regular shapes, exactly what you were just saying, Sam. And um, she did it with triangles and, and working out the difference between an internal and an exterior angle. So mm -hmm. the kids understood that it was 180 degrees interior but the default to program the edison then to drive you know at 60 degrees it doesn't work it's too tight so then she was showing them how to work out well it's actually it's that's not the angle that edison is driving it's on the outside and had all this mass but the kids really wanted that mass because they wanted edison to drive the shape that was on their work mat of that that regular triangle so i definitely think that 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 mass is something that especially for younger kids that programming in the robots comes a little bit more alive for them um, we've seen it ourselves quite a bit. Right. And it's the kind of thing where oftentimes when I'm talking to teachers and they say, well, I don't know what to do with a robot. I say, take whatever you're doing on your desk, make it bigger and put it on the floor. Right. Because yeah. even if, you know, and it's a great entry point. Obviously, I think robots are great for teaching collaboration, communication, group problem solving and all these things. But, you know, a starting point can just be, you know, we're going to take this, you know, triangle lesson and instead of drawing triangles, we're going to drive them. Yeah. And that requires a different flow of information, which I find oftentimes will slow kids down enough that they're thinking more about what they're doing. It, it was fabulous because when we saw them doing the triangle lesson and then they started to try to work out other shapes and they were immediately checking, okay, interior versus uh, external and how are, you know, so they were really applying that lesson straight away. And that I think that math just becomes so much more sticky. Anytime you've got that hands-on experience, it, it just becomes so much stickier for the kids then on out where it's, it, you know, I didn't learn geometry with a robot and I will admit I'm probably not the world's best uh, geometry you know participant but I think once you've done it once I've had the experience of doing it with that robot it does click in my mind better just even as an adult so and Phil do you have uh, an example you want to throw in yeah I mean uh, you know, I would say I mean the kids say they're growing up with robotics and automation all around them and uh, for me I try to look at this automation that we have around us and apply it to the Edison robot and design challenges for the kids to do. Um, so, I mean, everything from like when you walk into a room and, you know, sometimes you might walk into a bathroom today and all of a sudden it senses your movement and light goes on. You know, I made a little design challenge for my students to program Edison to be that little sensor and light. Um, even, you know, Doors open, you go to a supermarket, you know, the doors open automatically, automatically for you. You know, there's a sensor involved there. It's, there's a microcontroller and it's connected to a motor and that's how these doors are open. Well, now the, the kids are actually programming this real world stuff that's around them. This world we live in, it doesn't operate on magic. And now it's the first time where kids can actually, instead of just, you know, I start them off with playing coding games on the computer. But when we move to Edison, it's okay, now we're doing coding and programming, but the output is in the real world and you can actually watch the task being done. 
And it could be something even like as simple as a paper towel dispenser that you, you know, see in a restroom, you put your hands underneath and all of a sudden the paper towels come out. They don't come out forever. Only a certain amount is dispersed. And guess what? You can program Edison to do that. You know, one thing I, when I first experimented with Edison, I had them down on the ground doing all these tasks. And then I said, wait a sec, let me lift this thing up in the air. Let me turn it on its side. There's so much more I can do with this little robot. And when it, once you make those fixtures to hold Edison up in the air to be a paper towel dispenser, the kids get it. They see the connection, you know. So, um, you know, it's, for me, it's about exposing the kids to how the technolo technology in the world around them works. It's not working on magic. They can program it. And, and they can be creative with their programs, too. There's not just one way to write a program. You know, every kid can design a program differently. It's what it comes down to is, does it solve the problem? You know, when you put your hand underneath, do two paper towels come out, you know? <laughs> right. And, and what I love as a recovering teacher of English, what I love working with kids and robots is that when they do it, if the two towels don't come out, they're like, no, 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 let me do it again. Exactly. Right. I can I can fix this and they'll actually work at that. Um, whereas with, you know, English, it would be like, oh, no, your writing doesn't do what it's supposed to do yet. And they're like, you hate me. It's like, but no, no, it just doesn't do it. But, you know, the the even that is something that's, you know, that, that's how we'll bring it back around to my question. The error or failure is actually made tangible. Right. Like. Like it's a very real thing like, oh, that doesn't work yet. So I'm going to have to do it again. And it's not this abstract, you know, thing that I was always running to when teaching English. And I would tell them their work didn't work yet. And they're like, oh, you hate me. It's like, no, no, that's not it. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit more and this may just continue this conversation, but I want to focus a little bit on non stem classes. We have a lot of teachers in our audience. Many of them have, may have never thought about using robots and you know, they're perfectly happy with what they do. But um, I know that even in this group of educators, I've seen some amazing ideas about how robots can really be a vital part of non-STEM classes. And I'd like to open that up here. So I'd like to jump in, uh, Sam. So, so, I mean, to piggyback off of what everyone else is saying there though, uh, um, what Kat and Phil were talking about with making things tangible and bringing kind of that relevant learning uh, into the classroom, you know, things that they're already experiencing, things that are around them to make it part of that learning is, is super important because then there's there's those immediate connections. Um, and, and to add to that, one of the great things that I see a lot of classroom teachers doing now, uh, especially outside of your traditional STEM classrooms, is finding ways to use whether it's just the logic or actual coding programming itself um, as a means to an end. So it's no longer we're, le we're no longer learning just to code to code. You know, we're not trying to just make a rabbit bounce across the screen, but we're actually using that language uh, to either acquire the learning or to demonstrate that learning. And so something we've been focusing on uh, with the classrooms we've been working with is creating what we're calling parallel learning structures. So similar to any type of language acquisition. Uh, so you think of like a dual immersion classroom where students are having to learn a new language while they're learning the content. And so that's what we're referring to as that parallel learning structure. They're having to learn two things at once. And we're hoping to create experiences where that, that programming, that whatever the programming language it is, whether it's direct text or they're using blocks, can be that language that they're learning alongside with the content. And um, if you look at some of the, the, you know, the research and a lot of stuff folks that have been doing within these dual immersion classrooms, the learning uh, becomes much more meaningful and ingrained for these students because they're having to, to process twice uh, what it is that they're learning. And so for an example of this is um, taking something like uh, uh, your heart rate. So you think of a health classroom and you think of, of how blood is oxygenated in our heart, goes through our lungs and whatnot. Um, so our kids can, can watch videos and they can read the text on that and then draw an, an illustrated diagram that says, hey, this is how our heart works and this is how blood flows. Um, but we want to take that a step further and say, OK, well, why not program the Sphero? So let's do the, the the magic school bus. And now the Sphero is taking you through the heart and you actually get to travel through as as a blood cell. And as you enter that blood cell, uh, as you enter that that the the right side of your heart and it gets pumped into your lungs to be oxygenated and back to the other side of your heart, then to be 
distributed out through your body, you can actually program the Sphero or even the Edison to, to change colors to demonstrate that, that change in oxygenation of the blood. Um, but what's great is there's not only one way that works in your heart. There's actually two ways the blood comes into your heart and there's multiple ways that can, it, it can go out. And so to really demonstrate their understanding of how the heart works and oxygenates the blood and pumps it back out, they've got to be able to program that multiple ways. So in order to do that, not only are they increasing their understanding of how the heart oxygen helps with the oxygenation of our blood, but they're also furthering that understanding of, the, of, of programming. And so they're having to use that additional knowledge acquired uh, to code it as well. And then you can kind of scaffold that. So, okay, now you can program how it works you know, traditionally, but what does a heart murmur look like? What does a heart attack look like? What does arrhythmia look like? And you can ask them to demonstrate those things now that might we might be able to see on an x-ray or, or a cardiogram, but we don't see it day to day. And so we have them demonstrate that, make it more concrete for them uh, to demonstrate that understanding and learning. Uh, well, and you've described the kids building a simulation of a heartbeat, right? And then once you have that simulation, you can act on that simulation. But, you know, if you were to take the robots out of that, you know, maybe it's an animation, but it's probably just a labeled diagram. Right. And, you know, all of that dynamic application of information goes away. And that's, you know, when <clears throat> when I started teaching with the robots, I was really worried they were going to take up too much time. But when I looked at the return I was getting because, OK, the lesson maybe took a little bit longer but it took a little bit longer because all of the kids were applying the information they were learning as they were learning it. Uh, and that kind of application makes, as you were saying, Kat, the, the experience a lot more sticky, right? Everything mm -hmm. actually means something when they're encountering it. So they're not trying to memorize how blood flows through the heart. They're programming it step by step. They've systematized it, right? And once you've done that, you have to Frankly, you have to understand what you're doing pretty well in order to program it, right? So, it's it's interesting that you know you mentioned this dual pathways, and um, because the so obviously being based out of Australia, we do keep Australian curriculum in mind when we're designing lessons in, uh, for Edison, for example. They're applicable elsewhere, but we do make sure that the Australian curriculum requirements are getting met. And one of the things that the Australian curriculum has just really rolled out in the last couple instances of the curriculum is that kind of holistic crossover where your music lessons are supposed to be showing the maths in music or your tech lessons are supposed to be applying how tech then is actually acoustical engineering or whatever the manifestation in, in the real world is. And so it's, it's interesting, you know, for me on the other side of the world to hear what we're seeing is actually what uh, you know, teachers everywhere are doing, even if it's not in their re requirements of the curriculum yet. So uh, I think it's wonderful because I think this this crossover of, of bringing the subjects together is, is just so important because in life, that's how we experience everything. It's not, you know, well, today I'm just doing English and tomorrow I'm just doing home economics, you know. It, it's a kids being able to pull those connections in is fantastic so uh, it's very good to hear that the whole of the industry and the educators are all moving in the same direction so what are some other um to, to kind of bring back around and put a point any other examples of like really stand out non-stem classroom uses of robots before we move on well, the, this one we just got reported in uh, two days ago because someone was asking us about the musical notes in our Ed Pie program because she is a music teacher and she wants to create her own. She wants the kids to program through music notes using frequencies, and so she wants them to work out the math so she gets the periods right. And so we're just going through all this and making sure that that's possible. And and I'm very not musical at all, so. Well, I understood that, you know, sound and frequencies and all that, you know, just the putting it, listening to her explain what she's doing in this lesson and that music is just sounds that are named notes and it's a frequencies and it's a maths game and, and just listening to how she was teaching kids, not just memorize that this is C and that when you see it, you have to play this note, but actually to train their ears. That was fascinating to listen to. And while I will admit Edison is not the most musical of musical instruments, mm -hmm. it is something that they could actually then do and they could actually easily program a true, you know, sound differences, actually hear that difference and start to learn it and start to apply it when they're playing whatever instrument they're playing. 
That, that oh. I thought was just a phenomenal example. I, I love programming music. Uh, there was one of the toy, I do a lot of toy hacking and most toys have a little speaker in them. And mm. at least the electronic ones. And if you have a speaker in it, you can hook it up to a board and send. I mean, I, I sit the kid down with whatever music they want to play. Like we have the notes for Mary Had a Little Lamb. And then I give them the Hertz chart so they know what the frequency is of each of those notes. And about halfway through, they figure out that they have to program in the pauses as well as the sounds. Mm. And it ends up getting really, really interesting and fairly in depth fairly quickly. Um, but at the same time, like they they end up understanding so much better what's happening in music. Mm. Yeah, very much so. Sam, there's something um, also we've we've kind of it started just right around the time I started uh, a focus on storytelling. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're, you're a puppet master. I mean, you, I, Patui and, and all his friends, you know, right. um, we love them. And, and it's a, it's a way to add depth to, to a story. And, you know, as human beings, it's in our nature to be storytellers. Um, you talk to any child um, just about at any age and they'll talk your ear off for hours because they just like telling you about themselves, what they know, what's going on. Um, and just recently uh, we had a conversation at a Comic-Con event, actually, that we were invited to. And we were talking about, um, you know, since we are robot makers, we talked about some some robots that, that had influence in our lives. We talk about how in movies and comic books and things, we we give these human-like characteristics to robots. Um, and the way they get them is by giving them a story. Mm -hmm. um, and But what happens in our schools is oftentimes we take that story or that ability to tell story away from our kids, and it makes them more robot-like. And so we had this real depth, in-depth conversation of how do we bring storytelling back into our classrooms and just talked about that uh, outside of, you know, we're, I'm with Sphero or they're with this company or this publisher or whatever it was. We just talked about how do we bring storytelling back. And so that meant a lot to us. And we decided, hey, why don't we focus on finding ways that, that schools can bring storytelling back into the classroom across all curriculum. Um, so not just, you know, through programming or in language arts where it might fit traditionally, but how do we bring storytelling back? And so we've been working with some summer school programs, including Apple camps around the world um, on storytelling. And so we actually have a whole function in, within the app uh, that allows you to in, introduce sounds and, and emotions and things like that. And so now we're helping kids nice. animate or, or actually tell their story um, through the robot, whether the robot's acting it out or the robot is like the prop in the classroom while mm -hmm. they're telling their story. And so they create these programs, they work on timing, they work on delivery. And uh, we've had some pretty cool ones uh, back in Redmond. Uh, There's a classroom that worked on the three little pigs and they had four robots set up and they hit play all on their devices at the same time. And they had to work out the programming and the timing to tell the story of the three little pigs um, and have all the robots work like they're supposed to kind of as a ballet, uh, including the big bad wolf knocking down the houses and things like that. So um, it's, 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 a, it's a different way to tell stories. Granted, we can still tell wonderful, amazing stories without the technology. But as uh, you know, as mentioned um, earlier by Phil, it's what the kids, what's it's what surrounds the kids. It's what their life is about right now. They're they're just so encompassed by technology that is part of their norm. So why not allow them to use that to do these things that we're trying to get them to do to enrich their learning? Definitely. And you know, when you talk about augmented storytelling with robots and programming. Um, I think it's important to note that if I were to learn something and then explain it to you, that could be a story of how mm -hmm. I learned that, right? Like there's so much storytelling that we can do as formative assessment even. Um, so yeah, I, I love just when you talk about scripting out three little pigs and getting it you know, to work so they all hit play at the same time, I can just envision that. And if I wanted the students to stand and act it out, I would be very challenged as teacher director to keep them all engaged long enough to make that work. But when they're the director and they're making all of the important decisions about how this is going to work and they want it to all work together and they know they can do it, you know, that I'm always impressed with what kids can do when I get out of their way and they hold themselves accountable. Well, and, and another thing that you might, oh, sorry, Kirjan. 
I was just going to say, you know, to, to um, piggyback on what Jeremy was saying as far as the engagement, certainly robotics add a level of engagement, but I think it's important for our teacher listeners to, to also understand that it may feel like at times we're sort of trying to, you know, stuff robotics into a lesson that could be done in a different way, but I think um, the value added is not just engagement, but also, Sam, you and I have talked about this a number of times, just the, the complexity of the assignment suddenly is so much deeper and richer when you add that programming component. And right. you know, working so hard with not so much about getting kids to be tech savvy, but, but building resiliency and growth mindset and, and giving them an opportunity to work in an environment that is highly engaging, but also allows for them to do some self-correcting and, and editing without a lot of teacher intervention um, is so valuable. And I think um, teachers see the value as soon as they see it in action with kids. But I find that in working with teachers, it sometimes takes a minute to get them to see why they would add this, you know, these things to their lesson. Cause they're like, well, you know, I can sequence without the robots. And I'm like, yep, you can, but you can. Let, let's talk about, you know, how that lesson will be such a more powerful learning experience for your kids. And, and when they see it happening, they're sold on the value of robotics, but getting them, getting them there in the first place can be somewhat of a challenge because they're not always seeing, you know, they're, they're sort of pigeonholing. Well, that's not a STEM activity. Why are we using robots? You know, and, and it's really, it's more than just. When, you know, when I look at it, sake. right. And, and I look at it as, you know, I, my kids and I are going to do a lot of things and anything I want them to learn, I'm going to ask them to do a bunch of times because that's how learning works. And some of those times I'm going to have them use robots and sometimes they're going to use pencils and sometimes they're going to use paper and sometimes they're going to use robots tied to pencils drawing on paper. Right. <laughs> And, and that's okay, but there's just all of these different ways. What I like about robots is that's when I want to have a group activity. We robot up when I want the activity to move more slowly. We robot up, right? Because if you've got to do that programming, it's going to slow it way down. So if I've got something that the kids might be able to do an okay job on pretty quick, but I want them to get down into it more deeply that's when we use robots. Now, there are times when we find situations where we can do things because we have a class set of robots that we could not do without a class set of robots. And we haven't talked about many of those things yet, but I thought we could spend the last part of the conversation talking about things you can do with multiple robots. Now, I've been teaching with a class set of robots for four years now. And I'm going to go first because I love Robot Dance Party. Um, I have done... Who doesn't, robot, Who doesn't right? love Robot Dance Party? That, that's my point. That's why I'm like, I'm going to go first and take that one, right? <laughs> um, because it works so many different ways. You can program robots to dance with robots, people to dance with robots, people to dance with people. So many programming opportunities. And inevitably... If you have the kids drawing their own code, somebody looks up at you and asks the question something like, what's the code for booty shake? <laughs> <laughs> um, what other things can, other than dancing, can we do with multiple robots? Or have you seen teachers do with multiple robots? Well, one thing I love about multiple robots, because we try, you know, when we're, when we're working on new curriculum content, we're always, of course, experimenting in the office to make sure it'll work. And, and you know, when you work in the company, you have the advantage of having lots of robots. Uh, and one thing that we've talked about is how you can fail at just a spectacular level with multiple robots, because there's so many chances for something to go wrong. And how valuable that is, because if you have students that are a bit perfectionistic or just want to get the answer and just want to get it right. Exactly what you're saying with English, when you say that's not it, they go, well, this is all too hard or you hate me. With the robots, when it all goes crashing down, it's just, well, it's that third robot on the left that didn't do it at the right time. Let's go back to that program. And it, it, it inspires self-correction, as Jen is saying. It also inspires that collaboration, but it just teaches that resilience of, when something's gone wrong, it is not the end of the world. It is time to regroup, look again, and then 
to figure it out and, and get that solution to work so that everything does actually go according to plan. And that's and, one of actually my favorite things about it. And what's nice about that is the failure is physically somewhere else, yeah. right? Like when my students are having trouble with an English assignment, the problem is in their head and it's really yeah. hard for them not to take that personally, right? But yeah. even if the problem is they don't understand what they're doing with programming, we can see, oh, that problem is out there with that crazy robot. Exactly. And, and it takes that, I'm not understanding this out because the first thing is, oh, the robot didn't do what I expected the robot to do. So that's, it's immediately shifting that blame. And then you're clear headed enough to actually come up with the solution. And I've seen, I've seen kids help other kids when one of them is starting to now translate it back a little bit because they're getting so frustrated with their own robot. That's where another kid now sees that and goes, well, we can fix this. It's the robot, you know, and, and then you see that teamwork and that collaboration and those leadership skills just manifest in the classroom. And I just think it's fabulous. So real quick, Sam, if I recall, what's the code for Booty Shake was the first single off of your uh, disco album, uh, Robot Dance Party, right? <laughs> uh, yes, Ro Robot Dance Party by my cover band, My Disco Balls. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know if you wanted me to bring that up. I know sometimes you know it's not it's not. We like to keep it on the line. down low, but you know, once we're a good forty minutes into a show, we can say almost anything. Right. We want to. Right. Adding then, that to the Spotify list right now. Right. <laughs> so, so something we've seen done a lot uh, and that we, we we do a lot in professional development and things is with with a class set of robots is we do a lot of iterative iterate or I guess is that a word iterative mm -hmm. uh, engineering iterative. engineering uh, activities so we give students challenges and we ask them to complete a certain task sometimes they're uh, competitive events sometimes they're just kind of everybody does and sees what they can come up with um, but uh, it's all happening at the same time. So one of the big ones you see probably on Twitter a lot is the BattleBots. We give students a, a solo cup or 18 ounce cup, and then we give them all sorts of other things, uh, whether it be you know push pins or uh, toothpicks and straws and popsicle sticks and rubber bands and glue. And the goal is to actually end up creating a, a robot that's going to defend, but also attack the balloons of other robots. And they drive them around, they pop balloons, and they have a good old time. Uh, very similar to uh, kind of like Mario Kart esque. You know, we use small water balloons and blow them up with air because they're easier to pop. Um, and we've seen that taken all sorts of different ways. Uh, but one classroom that I worked with when we did it, we allowed the students to do it uh, without really a whole lot of instruction. We just said, here's your limited supplies. This is all you can use. Design something that's going to pop another, uh, another group's balloon. And that was really all the instructions we gave them. And then we let them battle it out and nobody popped a balloon. Like nobody popped a balloon. Like it just, it didn't work. Uh, they were putting pins on like on uh, what are they called pipe cleaners, and every time they go, oh, no. they go to pipe them, it would just oh, bend. No. <laughs> you know, or they'd be driving so fast that the cups would go flying off, and then there were penalties. They had to wait five seconds. But if your cup was laying on the ground, you're still free game, and people could drive up and pop your balloon. Fortunately, nobody popped balloons, so we came back and we had this this process uh, where we'd ask questions in the kids and groups with, and say, okay, what didn't work? Why weren't we popping balloons? What was the issue? You know, kids were finding that maybe their cups were top heavy or whatever it was. And they'd come back and say, OK, all right, guys, here's round two. Let's see how many points you can score. And they'd go in and they and they battle it out again. But there's all sorts of different uh, engineering activities that we're able to create, especially with these group ones where we're either working on physical science and we're asking kids to uh, create drag or, or reduce friction and things like that along the way uh, while they're working on these activities collaboratively. Now, I want to circle back to a really important detail in your description, Jeremy, that I think is key to creating a successful robot based experience. You said you gave the kids a bunch of stuff and you didn't know how they were going to build it. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, I think, is really powerful with mm -hmm. any of these robots is that you're creating an experience where you're like, okay, here's a totally controllable motor with some other features. Here's some stuff. Now I need you to do this other thing. And I always like, I always feel a little bit like I'm bamboozling my students because I say things like, I need you to build a steam engine with such utter confidence. There must be a way for it to be done. Right. But at the same time, I have not planned that out. In fact, if I planned it all out, it would kill the lesson 
because then the kids would either be successful or not successful at completing my instructions and they would be checking in with me every step of the way. But if you give the kids the resources and a challenge without directions, they are responsible for their own ideas and success. I love Phil's work in that space. Like that's, I can't even remember how exactly I first saw Phil's videos, but the, the, the Phil's YouTube videos, videos are cool. amazing. They're, so <laughs> and it's just one of those things that, you know, I literally have Edison robots on like every surface around me every day. And I just never would have come up with some of this stuff and watching these videos of like, you just need your Edison to drive through, you know, or drive a train track. And just when it goes through a tunnel, it just has to have the lights on and then off. And I'm just sitting there going, I totally believe you that this can be done. But in my brain, I'm just thinking through the lesson and thinking through the programming language and going, where, what, you know, it's amazing. And I, so I can see also though, I want to do it. Like our, our software engineers can't, like Phil comes out with a new video, we lose an engineer for a day because they've got to go do that. You know? So, you know, it's just the, so inspiring. If you're a kid as well, it's just like that, that idea that I could make this happen. That's so empowering to a kid that, that it's not just all the world is bigger than me and I don't really understand it, but oh yeah, well the teachers just told me to make a steam engine and said go and given me three things. Obviously, I guess I'm making this. Make a steam engine. Right, right. Exactly. I just think that that is just fantastic. It's so exciting. And yeah. and that's really, you know, why we're all here together because, you know, that's a big part of the common ethos that you know, uh, unites us as teachers, as ed tech creators. We want students to be empowered. We want them to be making decisions that matter. We want them to have control of their world. And with that, I'm going to bring uh, us to a close here. Do you want to add one thing, Phil? I do. I want to add something Excellent. there. I don't want to cut you off at all. <laughs> the, you know, the, the original question uh, dealt with, you know, uh, you know, how can we have multiple robots working with each other? And uh, one thing I try to present to my students is, you know, in manufacturing, we see this everywhere. Tesla, the car manufacturer, for example, if you ever get a chance, look up uh, on YouTube, their videos of how they manufacture their cars, because it's a complete like robotic assembly line. That's amazing and awesome to watch. Uh, so, you know, giving them those real world examples, and saying, okay, now you guys try this little design challenge. Uh, if they're if they can accomplish that, the feeling that they get from that accomplishment, I mean, they want to go home and tell their parents, they want to tell their friends on the bus, you know, they're really proud of themselves when they complete one of these design challenges. Uh, I will say a, a couple uh, de design challenges I've come up with, I haven't programmed them yet, but having the Edison robots uh, communicate with each other, uh, one thing you could do a little relay race where you know you have one Edison, you know, has to run to another Edison, which has to run to another Edison, which has to run to another Edison every time they come to close proximity. The Pony Edison Express, the Pony Ed Express, the Pony <laughs> Express. It. Yes, you call it that. <laughs> that, 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 I like that name. Um, another one, you know, I, I see this all the time where I live because I just have I railroad tracks right down the street from my house, but you know before the railroad or before the train gets to that railroad crossing there at the intersection, you know, about a mile down the road or half mile down the road or down the tracks, um, it's hitting a sensor and that sensor is communicating down to the road and they put a barrier down to block cars from crossing. So that's a little design challenge. I'm going to give my students where I have two Edison robots, maybe, you know, five feet away from each other. And when we block the IR sensor on one, you know, it controls a little flag on the other and blocks cars from going across the intersection, you know. Um, and another thing, I saw this I saw this one the other day, a, uh, a conveyor belt at a supermarket, you know, where I went up to, to pay for something at the supermarket and I put my items on the belt and the belt didn't move. And I knew right away something was up, so I looked at the cashier and she blocked the sensor. She had the mm -hmm. sensor blocked intentionally because she was tired of the belt moving all day. And I said, I like your little trick. She goes, what do you mean? I said, you block the sensor so the belt doesn't move. She goes, yeah, I'm so tired of that belt always moving. So I said, you just gave me an idea for a design challenge with my students. <laughs> Two Edison robots, you know, one's going to control a belt and the other one is going to be an IR sensor. And, you know, when there's no items in front of that IR sensor, that belt has to start moving. 
you know, so that the items can flow down, you know, while people are waiting in line to the person at the cash register. So, I mean, the, the, the ideas for challenges to give kids, they're around us and the kids say them, but let's give the kids the ability to program this in their hands and do it themselves. That's what, that's what robotics is all about, teaching robotics and, you know, automation to, to students and kids. Awesome. I couldn't say it better, Phil. I think that's a great spot to, to stop. And I want to thank all of you for just the, the great ideas that yeah. you brought in and shared with us tonight. Jeff, how do we do? I love it. I, I, I've been listening to this because, you know, in a few weeks, I'm gonna, we're all going back to school. And I'd like to bring robots into my K-12 position. And and I've done things like this before, where I've brought in a a a, a you know a, a robot or a STEM tool, and I've shown how it works. And then you say, "All right, now go. You have twenty minutes to play with it. Go have fun." And they look at it and go, "I don't get it." Or they look at it for five seconds, push some buttons, and go, "Okay." And then they're on their Facebooks. So my question for everybody here is, uh, you know, and I'd love to get everyone's kind of opinion on this, but. How do you motivate those who just don't get it yet? Or what can we do to show off that this is, you know, I, I don't want to walk into this PD session and give an hour demonstration on how to do scratch programming just so I can give them this little orange robot. How do I how do I do this? Because I'm not the STEM guy, but I'm trying to be the STEM guy to make totally non STEM teachers at least interested how do you how do you start with this and and, and you're uh, gonna say watch phil's videos yeah <laughs> that's what i was gonna say show them phil's videos they're awesome it, it honestly it's all about it's about baby steps i say this to my students all the time uh edison they have these tutorials on their website and you have to have the kids they have to be successful with edison or any robot for that matter you know within within 10 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes. Cause if they're not successful with that thing in 10 to 20 minutes, they're going to start to shut down. So, you know, have little tutorials for them to do that they can do in five and 10 minutes and be amazed at what they just created in those five to 10 minutes, you know? And, you know, myself, I'm giving them four or five, six tutorials before I release them to, Hey, here's some design challenges that you guys can be creative on. You, you learned everything in the tutorials here, and now you're going to apply the stuff you learned in the tutorials to some design challenges. And to prove to you that these design challenges work, here's the video, and you can watch it work. So these aren't design challenges that are impossible. They are, you know, it is capable to design these. And I think it's great about with, you know, a lot of the robotic platforms now is that the kids can design programs in your classroom, and if they're not successful in your classroom, it's not like, well, we can try again tomorrow. They can take it home with them. They can take it home with them. You know, you can, they can program on their Chromebooks at home. Okay. And, you know, it's not just a platform that's in the classroom. And they can try and write a couple programs and then bring them in the next day and we can download them into the robot and let's see if they work. So, you know, like I said, it really comes down to baby steps with the students. Well put. I would agree. The baby steps and the early success are definitely huge factor. So when we teach year three students, so you're talking eight years old, uh, nine years old kids, the first thing they well, really with any student I would recommend, but with those young students, when, when we're using an Edison, the first thing we have them do is run the barcode programs, which we have, which are preset programs that Edison runs over barcode and then does that program. So obstacle detection, for example, or just even driving, driving on a clap sensor tracking and things like that. Because once they've seen that happen, they're excited about it. Then when you transition to something that's a little bit more uh, creative and a little bit more risky in terms of you might not get it to do exactly what you expect in the first time, i.e. programming the robot, they have actually seen what the robot is capable of. So they have some sort of end marker. They've already had success. And when then it doesn't do exactly what they expected, they're okay with that because they know it's possible and they'll iteratively increase their own program till they get to that point and then they learn more and more as they work through it and they get more and more confident of trying something and seeing what happens and and, and just kind of taking it in the bite-sized chunks that they are comfortable with um and i've run you know dozens of 
teacher training stuff with the Edison or with uh, the kids. And, and I genuinely find that the kids are more willing to just have a go when it's simple to start with and then jump from there. But the teachers are, are sometimes fearful that if they don't already know the, the top end, they can't start at the, at the basic end. And, and I would just encourage anyone that's nervous about, well, I don't know the absolute upper limit of this, not to, to stress that, just give it a punt because you, like your students, can have something go wrong. And when it goes wrong, you just teach that in programming and in life, when something is not what we expected, we just give it another crack. And, and if you have that mentality that it's not going to be perfect, in fact, the less perfect, probably the better, you're, you're off to a great start. Jen, what do you think? I know you you're you know you're you're working all the teacher training and stuff, and you know, this could be a, a STEM question to you. This could be you tell people about labels and folders in Gmail and say, hey, you have 10 minutes to make a bunch of labels, and then you turn around and they're on a completely different personal topic. What do you look at and how do you approach these conversations when you're working with teachers who have little personal interest in what they're talking about? But you know, these are really, really important things. So, Jeff, I think that um, that's a big role of a tech coach is to provide that connection for teachers. I think it's it's reasonable to understand that teachers don't immediately understand looking at a platform that's new to them. Uh, you know, an idea like coding in their classroom is just a really foreign idea to most teachers. They see it and they think, I don't teach coding. Why do I need to know this? And so that to me is where you know, a tech coach that has experience in a classroom in another, whether or not it's the same curricular area, but as a general ed teacher can come in and say, listen, I, I know that this seems a little odd to hear that there is huge value in this for you, but let me give you some specific examples of what this might look like in the context of your classes. And I think we pointed out in the conversation today, some sort of general ideas around coding and robotics that are applicable to really any topic area, regardless of who's in front of you. And those would be things like sequencing activities, digital storytelling, and almost every, I mean, in every subject area, those are tasks that teachers are looking for kids to, to do. And so I think that, you know, by, by giving specific examples and then, then also simplifying and saying, do you see that these are these are all examples of sequencing or digital storytelling? Then it, it kind of boils it down for teachers and makes it a little bit more clear that, and, and we spoke to this earlier, people were saying, you know, we don't need to do a big, huge project. It needs to be these small wins for teachers. So it, it you know, when when sharing with teachers and trying to get them on board with the concept of robotics, having those small wins is so important because I can tell you without fail whenever I have brought robotics or coding into classrooms with teachers, it is always, without fail, a positive experience. And almost every time, these are teachers that are not so sure that this is gonna add value for them. So, so I think um, those would be some of the, the you know, thoughts I would share. Absolutely. Great words of advice. And, and what a great podcast. Thank you guys so much for spending time with us today. I want to give us all a moment to uh, to sign off and, and plug where we are. Jen, where do we find out more information about the great work that you're doing these days? So my blog is teachingforward.net and I'm on Twitter at teaching forward. And as I said, I'll be sharing a post um, of a teacher's work around Spiro um, in the coming week. So I'll have to link to our podcast tonight to just help teachers thinking uh, about more ideas. I think there were some great ideas raised in tonight's show. Excellent. And Phil, where do we find those great videos? Those great videos, uh, you can find those on my website. Uh, hopefully, it's a long URL. So hopefully, Jeff, you could uh, put it up on the screen. That'd be awesome. Uh, but I will say, uh, other than that, you can shoot me an email. Uh, it's my first name, first initial, P, and then G-R-I-G-O-N-I-S at upsd.org. Upper Park Yeoman School District. And Kat, how do we find out more information about these great Edison robots? Uh, the best place to start for Meet Edison is meetedison.com. Uh, and then you'll find from there links to our different programming languages, links to the, uh, the Edison itself. You'll also find all of our socials, so Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, growing Pinterest. Uh, I'm loving that. People, teachers are starting to share some incredible projects on there. So I def definitely recommend giving, giving that a look if you've got the time. But yeah, meetedison.com. 
Jeremy, I want to give you the last uh, the last word here because many people know Sphero as those wonderful robotic balls that are rocking around. But again, you just came out with two new products, right? You're doing a a Disney product that Spider-Man. has a race car Spider-Man. and a Spider Man thing. What is that? I think we have seen them, yeah, somewhere. Some maybe Facebook had something on them or something about that. Jeremy, talk to us a little bit about some of the other things that uh, Sphero is uh, is doing these days. So uh, because of our BB-8 tie-in with Star Wars, we have a really good relationship with Disney and everything that Disney owns now. Uh, so we recently were uh, commissioned to create a Spider-Man, essentially an interactive action figure um, that you can toss around, play with, takes you on adventures, uh, you become your own superhero, and uh, you get to fight crime and, and listen to funny stories and jokes with them along the way. Uh, he protects your room from intruders, um uh and then we've got lightning mcqueen who's actually one of my new favorite toys uh he's a fully animated uh remote control car um so it's not an rc car it's actually bluetooth uh, enabled but uh it's the first fully animated uh lightning mcqueen his shoulders rock just like in the movie when he drives his mouth moves his eyes emote uh pretty cool um he's got hundreds of sayings. You can actually animate them. You can create what's called movie mode where you go in and program some of the, the sayings or words, and then you drive them around. And while it's driving around, you can actually record it on the camera on your phone. So you kind of create your own little movie with them. Uh, but here, hopefully in the next uh, one or two updates of our app, you'll be able to actually program Lightning McQueen with a Sphero EDU app. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, but yeah, and you can find out more about Sphero EDU at Sphero.com slash education or at Sphero EDU on Twitter. And you can find myself at Mr. Macnology uh, on Twitter as well. And one more time, thank you guys so much for coming on. Sam, what a great show. Thank you so much for helping us lead this uh, show. And uh, am I correct in thinking that uh, the Beyond the Hour of Code podcast now has a disco track? Is that what I'm getting at now? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Fully interactive disco experience at beyondthehouroofcode.com forward slash disco. Don't forget the silent cue. <laughs> <laughs> very, very cool. Sam, where do we find you online? Me and all my things are at mypaperlessclassroom.com. Nice. And uh, you have a, a request of people who might still be listening to this podcast. You want them to vote for something? Am I right about this? Yes. If you are the South by Southwest panel picker voting type and you have a moment, we have a toy hacking proposal in the panel picker where we've got a teacher, a teacher from uh, we've got Sarah Boucher in New Mexico and Cicely Day in Oakland are working with me to put together a toy hacking curriculum that we hope to share at South by Southwest. Nice. And don't forget to check out the great stuff happening over on TeacherCast as we uh, bring you our first two reviews already from our TeacherCast Best in Class. And one more time, congratulations to our two newer. Um, We're going to have those reviews out, uh, what, Sam, next week, I believe, on Edison and also on Spiro. So uh, yep. the teacher cast best in class. We're going to be putting those out throughout the next month. And at the end of the month, we're going to be putting out a nice ebook for everybody that has all of our award winners and stuff like that for our first cohorts. There's a couple of great ways that you can be a part of this and all of our shows. You can find us on Twitter at TeacherCast. Leave us a voicemail over at TeacherCast.net slash voicemail. Email us at feedback at TeacherCast.net. And, of course, subscribe to this and all of our shows over at TeacherCast.net slash iTunes and TeacherCast.net slash YouTube. On behalf of everybody, here and the 160 episodes of the Tech Educator Podcast. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Take care of your kids and continue sharing your passions with your students. Good night, everybody. 